Hi! Welcome back to our class, Chemistry 100B Laboratory. Today, we are going to have a post-lab lecture on the activities which are the common laboratory operations and the kinds of matter. There are eight common laboratory operations that we are going to discuss for our post-lab lecture. The first of which is measuring volume of liquids. Now, in taking the volume reading of liquids, read the calibration that coincides with the meniscus. Now, in taking the volume reading of ordinary liquids such as the water, look at the liquid level at the lower meniscus. If you're going to take the volume reading of the mercury, look at the liquid level at the upper meniscus. Now, in the experiment that we had, we measured the volume of the water that can be contained in a test tube. So, when we measured it, it was found out that that test tube contains 17 ml of water. While that Erlenmeyer flask, we also filled that to the brim with water, and the water contained in the Erlenmeyer flask measures 73 ml. In your laboratory guide, you are asked to fill up the table there for the volume of the water contained in the test tube, as well as the volume of water contained in the Erlenmeyer flask. It was expressed in terms of ml, but you are also asked to express it in terms of liters. So you need only to convert the ml unit to liters unit. The second common operation is measuring the mass. In measuring the mass, we're going to use the platform balance or the triple beam balance. Before you're going to weigh the object in order to get its mass, you have to check first whether the pointer of the triple beam balance points to the zero mark. However, if the pointer does not point to the zero mark, you have to adjust the tear and make it point to the zero mark. And make sure that the pants are also clean and dry. In the experiment, you were asked to measure the mass of the table salt. Now, we are told that in weighing objects, do not place the object or any substance directly into the pan. So what are you going to do? You're going to place this substance into a watch glass or any empty container. Now, in order to get the mass of the substance, you have to weigh the empty container, such as the watch glass in our case, and weigh also the watch glass plus the table salt. Then, get the difference between the weight of the watch glass or the container plus the substance, in our case, which is table salt, and the empty container. In our case, it's the watch glass. When the watch glass was weighed, the mass of the empty watch glass was 32.5 grams, while the watch glass and the table salt was weighed, its mass was 45 grams. So the weight of the table salt, therefore, is the difference between the mass of the watch glass with table salt and the mass of the empty watch glass. 
But if you're going to look at your lab guide, you are asked to convert this mass in grams into pounds. The third common laboratory operation is the transferring of liquids. Now, when we transfer a liquid from one vessel to the other, in the absence of a funnel, we are going to use a glass rod or a steering rod or a glass tubing. Now, how are you going to do it? You are going to hold the glass rod, say to it that the glass rod does not touch the opening of the container or the receptacle while the tip of the glass rod should rest on the side of the container and the tip of the glass rod should rest on the inside part of the container. The fourth laboratory operation is heating liquids in a test tube. In heating liquids inside a test tube, you have to hold the test tube with a test tube holder, then heat the upper part of the liquid without heating the empty part and bring the test tube back and forth over the flame positioned at 45 degree angle with the flame and the open end of the test tube should not be pointed to anybody. What is the reason why you should hit the upper part of the liquid rather than the bottom part first? This is to prevent the sudden formation of vapors and also prevent the liquid to spurt out. Another common laboratory operation is precipitation. Now, precipitation is a process of forming a solid by reacting to or more chemical reagents. In this activity, we are asked to add 2 ml of a solution of sodium chloride and to this solution, we are asked also to add 2 ml of silver nitrate. Then, when we added these two reagents inside the test tube, you saw a white solid substance. This solid substance is known as the precipitate. In this case, the solid substance or the precipitate formed is silver chloride because this is the result when we add sodium chloride plus silver nitrate equals silver chloride the precipitate plus the sodium nitrate which is the liquid part and after making that precipitate we are asked to allow this precipitate to settle down once it's settled, we add more drops of the silver nitrate solution. This is to make sure that the chloride ions are all precipitated by the silver ions. If you observe that there are no more further precipitation that occurred, then that is an indication that the chloride ions have been completely reacted with the silver ions. The next common laboratory operation is filtration. In filtration, this is a, the separation of a solid from a liquid by using a filter paper and funnel. Because we're going to use here a filter paper, you were taught during the pre-lab lecture that when a filter paper is used, you have to fold it diagonally, 
then fold it again diagonally and one part of which where when you open it has three sheets cut a little to that side or corner of the filter paper this is to prevent the filter paper from protruding outside the funnel and the correct size of the filter paper to be used must be always smaller than the funnel and before you are going to use that filter paper for filtration operation then you are going to wet it or moisten it first with water in this activity for filtration we are asked to pour the liquid part of the substance after precipitating the silver nitrate with sodium chloride so when you pour it through the filter paper you saw that there was a substance that passes through the filter paper and this substance that passes through the filter paper is called as the filtrate therefore in this case the chemical component of the filtrate is actually sodium nitrate another common laboratory operation is decantation in decantation this is a process of separating a solid from a liquid by pouring slowly and carefully the supernatant now in this procedure we were asked to shake the precipitate that we obtained in precipitation with water then after shaking it with the water we allowed the precipitate to settle down after the precipitate has settled down at the bottom of the test tube we decant the supernatant carefully when you are going to decant the supernatant you have to do it slowly and carefully taking extra care that you will not pour out also the solid part let the solid part or the precipitate remain in the test tube in the process of decantation the chemical component of the supernatant which you poured out carefully is actually only water or h2o Another common laboratory operation is evaporation. In evaporation, this is a process of separating a solid from a liquid using heat. In this process, the filtrate that was collected in the filtration operation was evaporated to dryness, taking care that when evaporating the filtrate, the residue that was left will not be overheated. In this case, the substance left after evaporation called residue is actually sodium nitrate. Let's go to the kinds of matter and their properties or activity number five. Now, what are these kinds of matter? If we're going to look at the diagram for the kinds of matter, matter is of two groups. We have the pure substance and the mixture. When we say a pure substance, this is a substance wherein the components of which are uniform throughout the system. When we say uniform throughout the system, that means if you take a sample from one part and take another sample from the other part of that same system the component of those samples that you took from the substance are the same for a pure substance 
there are two groups of these. One, we have the element, and the other one is the compound. When we talk about the element, the element is a substance that is composed of only one kind of atom. These elements are represented by a symbol. And these symbols are usually taken from the first letter of the name of the elements. And there are also elements which are represented by the first two letters of their name of the element. And there are also those in which their symbols are taken from the first and the third letters of the name of the elements. However, there are also those elements in which their symbols are taken from their Latin names. On the other hand, a mixture is a kind of matter wherein its composition is variable, meaning you can change the component or the composition of that kind of matter. Not like in a pure substance that the component is constant. With this kind of matter, the mixture, there are two kinds of mixture. One, we have the homogeneous mixture, and the other one is the heterogeneous mixture. In a homogeneous mixture, we can only find here one phase, meaning if you have the solute and the solvent mixed together, they, these two are uniformly mixed that you cannot distinguish anymore where is the solute and where is the solvent. However, in a heterogeneous mixture, you can find two or more phases after mixing different substances. For example, when you mix the water and the oil, we can find that the oil floats on top of the water. Why do you think that the oil floats on top of the water? This is because the oil has a lighter density than the water. In the procedure for the kinds of matter and their properties, the first procedure there is we were asked to take note of the physical state, color, and the solubility of sulfur and antimony in carbon disulfide. As you have observed, the sulfur is a solid as well as the antimony, which is also a solid. The color of sulfur is yellow or lemon yellow, while the antimony is gray or dark gray or grayish black. When we added the carbon disulfide to sulfur, I think you have observed that the sulfur dissolved in carbon disulfide while the antimony did not dissolve in carbon disulfide. So if you are asked, what is the system formed when you added the sulfur with carbon disulfide? So you will say it was a homogeneous system. Why? Because the sulfur dissolved totally in carbon disulfide. But when you are asked, about the antimony when added with carbon disulfide. So it was insoluble, therefore the system was heterogeneous. And how do you classify sulfur being a pure substance? The sulfur is an element, likewise the antimony is also an element. The next procedure asks us to mix 1.5 grams of antimony with 2 grams of sulfur by means of a mortar and pestle until a uniform mixture is obtained. You have observed that when these two 
substances were mixed in a mortar and pestle, it formed a uniformly mixed substance. Then one half of this mixture was transferred to a test tube and was added with carbon disulfide. It was stirred and allowed the solid portion of the mixture to settle down. When the solid portion settled down, how do you describe the system? Of course, you will say it's a heterogeneous mixture because the antimony in that case did not dissolve in the carbon disulfide. Only the sulfur was dissolved in carbon disulfide. Then, this mixture was allowed to settle down. After letting the mixture settle for some time, it was decanted. So, the supernatant was decanted and allowed to be evaporated off without the use of heat. Now, why do you not heat it? In evaporating the supernatant, heat is not applied because the carbon disulfide is flammable. Anyway, carbon disulfide is also very volatile. What do you mean by volatile? This is the ability of a substance to evaporate off. After evaporating the supernatant, you saw and observed that the residue left was yellow in color. And what do you think is the chemical name of that residue? It was actually sulfur. The residue was sulfur because that sulfur dissolved in the carbon disulfide. And when the carbon disulfide was decanted, with it was the dissolved sulfur. Another procedure that was done in this activity was the magnesium ribbon was ignited using the non-luminous flame of the Bunsen burner. You saw and observed that when the magnesium ribbon was ignited, it formed a very bright light. And after burning the magnesium ribbon, it left a white residue. So if you are asked to write the chemical equation for the burning or ignition of the magnesium ribbon, it is magnesium plus oxygen equals magnesium oxide. That solid substance that was formed after burning the magnesium ribbon is called magnesium oxide and you are asked is the resulting product an element a mixture or a compound now magnesium oxide is a compound why is it that that is a compound magnesium oxide is a compound because it is already composed of two different atoms magnesium and oxygen. Another procedure done in this activity was the iron filings was added with sulfur. These two substances were mixed intimately in the evaporating dish. Then after mixing these two, it was divided into two parts. One part was placed in a test tube and it was heated slowly over a low flame, while the other half was retained in the evaporating dish. When the mixture was heated, you saw and observed that the mixture formed bubbles and there was also the formation of a gas. Now, you are asked, 
Describe the product obtained after heating. I think you saw that product which I placed into the watch glass. Then you are asked, is that product formed an element or a compound? That product is already a compound. Why? Because the iron plus the sulfur, when heated, will form ferrous sulfide or FES. Since it is a compound because there are already two atoms composing the product, the iron and the sulfur. For the chemical equation, you have it there, iron plus sulfur equals ferrous sulfide, or Fe plus S equals FES. Now comparing this product with that left in the evaporating dish, I think you saw and observed that they have different color already. That one left in the evaporating dish was dark, while the product between iron and sulfur after heating is light yellow. For next meeting, kindly read in advance the procedure for the next activity, which is changes in matter. That would be all for today. This is your teacher, Professor Nesitas Ruiz of Holy Name University.